<laughs> well, that's what I see. That, that's what I love to do is like geek out on all the theory. Yeah. And then like take it and translate it into like human speak. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So hello and welcome. Um, I'm here today with uh, Tori Olds. Um, this is a part of a series of interviews we do with practitioners of experiential forms of psychotherapy. So um, in this series, we interview a, a, a wide variety of experiential therapists. So to compare and contrast the thinking and techniques of di different experiential schools. So just a little bit about Tori. So Tori Olds, PhD, is a therapist based in Texas, Austin, Texas. The website that she's on is deepeddypsychotherapy.com. Uh, Tori uh, draws on a number of different strands of therapy, uh, things like AEDP, PACT, somatic experiencing, uh, bringing a lot of mindfulness uh, to her work and working with a variety of clients, obviously, with whatever they're, they're, they're needing help with. So um, without further ado, um, Tori, you're very, very welcome. And it's great to have you here. Great to be here. Thank so you. maybe we could begin with, you know, just talking a bit about like how you practice and how you, you know, how you think of the way you work. So how, how do you consider your way of working? Do you consider an experiential way of working and how is it experiential? Yeah, so I definitely consider myself an experiential therapist. I'm pretty integrative because I've been doing this a while, about 20 years. And um, I was also raised by two psychologists who did experiential therapy. <laughs> so my early you know, when I was in high school, even when I was like angry with my dad, I would like have him sit there with his feet on the floor. And, you know, it's like, I can feel the anger in my fist and this is what it wants to say to you. And like, that was our family language. So I was really lucky to get that kind of um, mindfulness and um, emotion, especially focus on emotion from my parents. Um, <clears throat> and then I also kind of got into some mysticism and meditation 20 years ago, a lot of mindfulness practice. Um, but um, but I also love geeking out on theory. So I love learning different techniques. You know, I sometimes I'll tell my students, cause I train, I do five training groups a week. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I'll tell my students, it's kind of like being in love with many men or something. <laughs> you know, it's like, I feel like I can't choose one. They're all so wonderful. Um, my main ones, as you said, are ADP. I draw a lot on IFS and coherence therapy is uh, pretty primary for me. Um, some somatic experiencing packed. <clears throat> and I love how, you know, having gone to the trainings and <clears throat> reading about and listening and practicing, but I also just love to learn about, it's almost like finding what are the common elements or like, if this is true and this is true, what hasn't quite been said yet. So it's like, it's, I love participating in that and like sort of developing theory and finding ways to explain it and kind of put in everyday language, not just for my clients, but really my passion is teaching. So for my students, like, okay, so I think they're also trying to say this, you know, here's the bottom line. And then this theory does this aspect really well. And this theory does this aspect really well and how you might integrate them. Um, but all the theories I do integrate are definitely experiential because I believe that's how the mind learns is their experience. So I was going to ask you, have you always worked in this way? But you sort of answered that question. Um, so, um, yeah, so um, in terms of like, could you give it a, give us an example? Um, I know we're kind of jumping in quite early into this, but mm -hmm. like a way you might work with a, with a new client that would be experiential. Yeah, well, you know, there's, there's a number of ways to think about what, experience, what experiential therapy is about. So one, so let me just say a couple things. One, like there's two main ways that like experiential working might help develop our capacity and our psychological resilience. And one is sort of the slow and steady method. And one, it, what Bruce Ecker calls like incremental change versus transformational change. So experiential therapy is great because it like very, I think the mind just learns through experience. And again, th through these two avenues, one is more what you think of like when you're learning piano or learning a new sport, it's like just through practice. You know, the, the mind needs a chance to develop new neural pathways, you know, it's like through repetition and like slowly um, modifying and adjusting. Um, and then the other way we can learn experientially is more in that kind of like, we had a new experience that so was in contrast to what we expected to have happen that our brain reorganizes and says, 
I have to update my map of reality. That was so surprising to me what just happened. Um, that it's like in a moment, our worldview, but unconscious worldview, <laughs> more than a conscious one, you know, can shift and our reality shifts. And then our way of being in the world can shift suddenly. So, you know, I like using both in therapy. So um, the one that's kind of more like, can we coax a new experience to emerge? Um, and that would look like, um, like, well, from ADP, it would call moment by moment tracking. It would say, it would look something like, Okay, so what are you experiencing? Focus on experience. And then now what are you experiencing? And even just putting our awareness on experience is a new experience, right? So it's like, well, now that I slow down and a bit of, I'm aware, oh yeah, there is some anxiety there. But if we bring mindfulness to it, that's a new, a new thing can unfold than what we would normally do, which is like go to defenses or just shut it down or pretend it's not there or ignore it, <laughs> all the things we do. When we can slow down and be with it, it's like, it's like, oh, actually, um, oh, now an impulse can come for like, I don't know, like putting my hand over my chest or like some care comes for it or something or, or some understanding comes like some words about what I'm anxious about or um, actually just noticing I'm anxious. Actually, right. It's like it, it went down now. And then if a therapist, this is the moment by moment part can say, okay, well, now what happens? You know, if we, if we do it the awareness route, a really different thing unfolds. And if you keep tracking along with it, it's like, well, now what? Well, now what? Well, now what? And how is that? And how is it to notice that this is going differently? It's like, it's almost like a new unfolding happens with so much learning. It's like such a rich learning around how to be with our experience, you know? And then, and then, so that's beautiful. And that looks like just asking a lot, you know, I, I'll print up these lists of experiential questions for my, my students, you know, it's like, what's happening now? And how is that to notice? And what is it like to say that out loud? And what is it like to hear me say that? And, you know, I'll have this list. Um, but then through that process, there's these aha moments because, wow, I didn't know that slowing down and touching into this pain would actually feel good. You know, it was maybe hard for a second, but when you stayed with me, and when I could see you could handle it, and when I could find that I can handle it, like I feel a lot better now. Oh my gosh. I thought if I touched into that, I'd be depressed for a week or I would be overwhelmed, you know, or I'd be for too much for you. Or, but actually, I feel that felt good. And, and then it's almost like, and then it's like the aha moments, you know, where it's like, that was a big surprise, you know, and then, you know, and then, of course, how is that to notice and really catch the surprise? So it can be really unfurled and really learn from fully in a way that the, the brain can reorganize like in a moment in very powerful ways. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, no, I love that way of thinking about it, Tori. Um, Cause I was thinking about this before our interview that, you know, Bruce Ecker and the queerings therapy approach really emphasizes um, sort of transform transformational change, these kind of aha moments. Mm -hmm. And they're mm -hmm. great when they happen. Yeah. But a lot of times in therapy, it's, you know, you're just, doing a little bit with what's happening right now. You're increasing mm -hmm. awareness, like you say, noticing and tracking. And it is about, you know, bringing new elements to experience that may not be like kind of, you know, sort of big, big aha moments, but gradually a person's learning a new way to be with their own experience and with another person, I guess. I think that's right. And I think sometimes people need that new um, path to be established and even possible in order for their, in order to have a new experience that then can be the aha, like, oh, like maybe it wasn't possible before that they could touch into that without getting overwhelmed, you know, and, you know, and so it's like, but if they have a, if they, if a new pathway is now known, it's like, oh, that's, that's an option now. And then the brain can say, oh, that actually works a lot better than my old option, <laughs> you know, where I was doing it this way, sort of unconsciously, but now I can compare it consciously and really allow like a rewriting of the encoding of like pattern and habit and this is how I do it, you know, to happen on a neural level. And I'm thinking about things like um, what we call sometimes mentalization, which is- Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, just kind of like, can I think about this experience? Can I, can I share it with myself? Can I share it with somebody else? And is it not weird? Kind of, is it- <laughs> And is it safe? Yeah, yeah you know, safe. there's two, you know, I was thinking about this too. Like, I think there's two kind of main reasons experiential work is so important. And one is the one I kind of already mentioned where, you know, it's just the brain learns through experience. It, it, it pays attention to experience. You know, it's like, I think it was like the proof is in the pudding for the brain. It's like, 
Yeah. Like it, our brain listens to concepts. It can be influenced by them, but much more powerfully than concepts. It, listens, it, it pays attention and learns from what it actually sees, like what actually happens, what it's, what it experiences, you know, like what my, what I saw unfold in real time in real life. So I think it, one, we power more powerfully learn from experience. And then the other piece of why to be experiential is we learn a lot about our experience. Like a lot of our wounds have to do with um, how to approach our experience. Um, is it okay to have sadness? Is it okay to have anger, need, sexuality, a memory? You know, it's like the inner world. So it's like, there's kind of, those are little slightly different reasons. One, we have to have, an, but like, it could be about something outer, like, um, I'm afraid of elevators. That's not like an inner, that's not, you know, but yet you still need experiential work. You need to get on the elevator, have a new experience around elevators, right? So that's one piece. But then the other of like, yeah, a lot of our work is around um, developing a new experience of our experience. I mean, that sounds kind of, I hope that is clear, but like we've, we're so phobicized is my invented word. I don't know if that's a real word, but <laughs> we've become so phobicized, many of us, of our inner world. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's like a threat. It's a threat. Yeah. It's either too much for me or too much for you, or, um, you know, I'll be punished for it. I'll be, or, or I'll just be ignored around it. Cause my parents don't have the capacity to, um, do anything with it. So they kind of ignore it, but then that's punishing in itself. Right. Because then it's overwhelming to do as a kid. You can't do it alone. Yeah. Um, I feel like we could just wrap up now. We're kind of, we could all figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. Cause I had, I had a little bit of a, 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 not an agenda, but just like a fantasy of, 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 a t of something that might be fun to talk about. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's, it's, it's um, my word for it is completion. Okay. Um, but for me, it's a big part of what, how, sort of how the mind works and, and, but how experiential therapy works and different experiential therapies do it in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something I've kind of started in the last few years, really sort of being a central um, concept in, in how I'm teaching, you know, experiential work. Um, so I kind of came with that as like, a, hey, maybe if we have time, we can talk about completion. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to hear about it, uh, Tori. So yeah, tell me about completion. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, so this is something that in some ways, um, it's certainly not a, um, I'm not the first person to notice this. Um, I've actually, the reason I started talking about it, about completion is because I actually did notice it in just about every form of therapy. Um, but different therapies had different words for it, but, it, and, and it was like looked differently. Um, but I was like, it really is about maybe completion can be the word. I think I probably got that word most closely from, um, somatic experiencing mm -hmm. because they talk about completion of like self-protective responses. Um, but then I was kind of comparing that. I was like, okay, so that's important to complete self-protective responses. I can, I'll, I'll expand this in a little bit, but, but then there's also different types of completions that the, the brain needs to feel empowered and some around emotional, some around grieving, finding new meanings. Um, so I started kind of thinking more broadly about what I'm calling completion. And I think what it, what it has become for me is simply the mind needing a chance and needing to feel an open avenue where there's safety and even some coaching and learning how to do it, but also just safety <clears throat> to continue its, I don't know, sometimes I call it like the work of the mind, like to continue whatever process gets started. Um, so we have some very innate sort of evolutionarily, you know, in us um, things that the brain wants to do. If we're in danger, you know, fight or flight. It wants to like look around and see that what the out is and try to run away. And if that's not a possibility fight and you know, there's like a progression, maybe first we freeze and then we go into fight or flight. And then we, this is what somatic experiencing talks about. Then we kind of like shake it off and regroup and, and then we're on to the next thing. There's like an arc to that, you know, on an emotional level, when we're children, I think this is what attachment theory is about. <clears throat> when, when there's a problem, an issue, um, a distressing event, you know, maybe our toy breaks, um, well, something has to happen next, but the child probably can't do it. They don't know how to fix a toy or <laughs> whether that's even a problem, right? 
So they just have this rise of emotion. It's like the nervous saying, nervous system saying like, I'm gonna have energy because I think something needs to happen here. And, and I don't know what yet, but at least the, I'm gonna pay attention to that rise because it's information that maybe something needs to happen and I, I need to pay attention. Um, but when we're a child, it's not just, I need to pay attention. It's like my parents need to pay attention to this, you know? <laughs> so we like run to mom and dad or whoever it is and say like, my toy broke or, you know, whatever. And then it's like, that's the next step. So first emotion, then run to mom and dad. And then they slow down with us and do a, a next step, which really can either go to problem solve. Okay, let me fix your toy. Great, that's easy, right? Or maybe the toy, if it's not solvable, like maybe the toy is really broken and can't be fixed, then they help us do some grieving, which also is like an arc. It's like the brain needs to do something there. It can't just stop it. It has a next step, you know? And the next step is like, okay, I need to integrate onto my map of reality that toys can break. I didn't know that, right? Or whatever it is, you know? So it's like, okay, that's upsetting. But if I can look at that while being held by the parent, then it can integrate into an overarching map of reality where both good and bad exist. And there's so much I could say about each of these pieces, but just to kind of give an example. And then, and then some settledness comes and then some learning just happened basically. You know, I just became a more resilient, uh, not naive because I know where the dangers are now. And I've learned and I, I stayed with it and like, wow, that really sucks. You know, <laughs> like I better not throw my toy against walls or whatever, but also I learned like, and I'm still loved and accepted and I can like face reality again. Is that making some sense so far? Yeah, no, I really like it. And um, part of my training was guest child therapy and we always looked at unfinished business. There you go. Yeah. Same idea. It's not experiencing. Yeah. And you're right. You know, we, we hit a bump in the road as children or adults and we're not sure what's supposed to happen or what can happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we feel like something's yeah, yeah. gonna happen, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. so for me, it's like, um, and I think that's the juxt of what, the, the, the gist of what trauma is, is there was some, the brain needed to feel, the brain in relation, I'm thinking the body, the mind slash body, um, the mind body, you know, like, knew it needed to do something and either that was blocked or it was just trying and felt like I'm not enough. So it was like, just a hopelessness comes with it. Like a learned hopelessness. I, I was trying, but it just wasn't working. The completion wasn't wor you know, working. Um, or I was punished for trying to go for completion. And, and, you know, I've been really trying to expand my way of thinking of this beyond just attachment and, or the kind of things I learned in somatic experiencing, like car accidents and, you know, sexual assault and things, but also looking at racial trauma, you know, if a person's like, like, like say that they're being, um, I don't know, like questioned by a police officer or something like that. And their whole body is saying, right, rightly so, like, I need to run. Right. But they know if they do, like they could be shot or in jail or, you know, and it's like, it's like when that, when that, when that, ah, that's like, those to me are like the traumatic because there's, it's so disempowering. It's like, I have this power to do something like, um, and for a kid, it's more like, I need to borrow my parents' power, but like, I can run to them and I'll be empowered through their wisdom, or I can use my body, you know, but if like the mind's gearing up for that act of empowerment, you know, and then for some reason it is blocked. You know, it, 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 it imprints this, like, um, this sense of like, well, what do I do? Like I, I, the world has just become a much more dangerous place. If I can't, if I can't respond to it with empowerment in a way that like goes somewhere and finishes, finishes with a happy ending, even, you know? Um, yeah, and so I just, like, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. yeah, like we kind of have to, the person has to stop themselves. Yeah. And yeah. locate that their own impulse because it's not safe to to, to yes. try the thing that might complete it. I guess yeah. exactly. So we we, we learn in inhi in, in inhibition, you know, yeah. um, which is why those what are called inhibitory affects, shame and anxiety, come to say stop. Don't don't finish. Don't don't do what your your deeper mind wants to do. Um, and um, and I think a lot of that. So I so for me, when people come into therapy, it's like what part of the completion arc, you know, some 
some part of that arc from like the problem or the difficulty, or even that, um, it can be a positive emotion, like an opportunity. And I feel positively, but I wasn't allowed to take the opportunity or something like that, you know? So it's like, it's like what part of that arc toward just like empowered engagement where I feel in flow with my mind and body and can act with clarity of, you know, and, and emotional alignment. Like, yes, I'm angry. I'm going to set a boundary or I'm sad. I'm going to reach for care. You know, it's like, what part of that whole arc, like, did I learn was not safe? You know, is it going to be punished, blocked, or just hopeless, you know, but often was, was punished by so, somebody often. It's like somebody in my life didn't want me to finish that arc, you know, cause it would, it would, you know, it would mean my parents would have to feel something or show up for me, or it would mean, you know, um, or like, uh, on the, on the um, social justice part, like, like one of the completions could be, I think this is why people are talking a lot about gaslighting. It's like, Hey, community, we, as a larger collective are supposed to be able to speak a problem and that be the beginning of a whole process, you know, of like, oh, kind of like running to the parent or, right, you know, whatever. It's like, like, oh, well, let's process this, see what the truth is, and then what action needs to happen out of that. And so that's kind of why any, I guess, any form of gaslighting, for instance, but um, between groups, it's like, that's very disempowering it's like, and very um, soul crushing or something. It's like, this is not how it's supposed to go. <laughs> you know, we're supposed to be able to talk about things and like, look at things and, and show up with resource so that the next step and then the next step and then, you know, can, can kind of unfold. Yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about coherence therapy and things like IFS where the kind of the, the coherence or the, the kind of the logic of the, the yeah. intuition, like yeah, come, yeah, it comes from a real experience where actually in order to be safe or in order to avoid, a, yeah, the person had to not complete. Would you, would That's you kind right. of be, yeah. Yes. Would you be a, it's, yeah. I, I, that's, that's such a wonderful point. And like, so if that, it, it's almost like, okay, so like, if that's the case, that um, that's where most of our wounding comes from, is something that our mind, our deeper brain, very health, it's like there was a healthy thing that was starting. And it was like almost in that moment, we were trained, don't do that healthy thing. So no wonder we're not healthy. <laughs> you know, like, and so, and so, um, so there's what I've been finding in different experiential ways of working is again, kind of the, it actually goes back to the two ways a little bit that um, we can try to go ahead and support completion and happening, or we can slow down and really understand the block. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes with my students, I'll, I'll describe that as like leaning into the new or leaning into the old, like we're going to try for a new thing that's never happened to happen, which will always be some type of completion. Um, or will we slow down and not push for anything new to happen and just understand what's already there, you know, like, um, and coherence therapy is probably the most like deeply articulated and aligned with the second one where they're like, oh, we're not going to push for anything. We're not going to try to teach you a new thing or, you know, get you, you know, um, uh, we're going to kind of be what they call non-counteractive. We're not going to counteract. We're just going to like slow down and look at like, where do you go and why? And then, and really understand the why underneath. Like, oh, you learned. You don't like, let's say, um, be vulnerable with your partner or something. Because like, okay, you learned that when you're vulnerable, your dad tells you that you're weak or whatever, you know, and then, and that you get punished. Or, so it's like really slowing down, understanding, oh, that's, the place where you go somewhere else that's not completion. And it probably has a cost. It always does have some cost, even if it saved our butt the first round. Um, and, can, and, and can we just look at that and see if there's, like, does that still feel true that it's necessary to not complete kind of, you know, they don't use that language, but I think that's, and then other therapies like ADP where it's like, they literally say they privilege the new, like they're looking for a new completion to happen, you know, or somatic experiencing. So they're like, using interpersonal support and mindfulness to see if like, um, uh, sometimes I think of it as like these things, these, these um, information like pieces, like emotion, like, or, you know, we take it in like kind of coming from the deeper brain up. It's like, it's like they're coming like those, those pieces of information, I'm angry or I'm whatever it is, or I, or I have a, I have a brilliant idea. Oh, but I'm not supposed to be brilliant. So I, you know, whatever. It's like, as things are coming from our true self or true mind, it's like they're coming up and then it's like, 
instead of like really blossoming into what it could be, it's like, it's like, it kind of gets like bent, you know, it's like, okay, here's how my mind actually is. And it creates like almost like a shape, like, okay, when this happens, I go here and then here, you know, I know that I'll be punished. I do this instead, you know? So if that's the image, it's like, I think of it as like some forms of therapy, like ADP or ISTDP, or, you know, are like kind of like almost coaxing from above, like, keep telling me, keep telling me, I, like, keep telling me this stuff. I'm here to like, let it land with clarity and I'm safe and I really want to know. And so it's like, it's like okay, okay, okay. I'll, I'll tell you like, and it starts like, like then the connection kind of starts to happen. And it's like, ah, like, doesn't, isn't that amazing? You know, whereas other for like where, how I imagine coherence is like, like if this were like a shape, like coral underwater, it's like just being a deep sea diver and going in and being like, let's just meet you here and like get the shape, you know? Okay. This, we're not trying to change the shape yet, but we're just like, let's get the, let's learn about all the tendrils of, of, of this. Um, yeah, absolutely. I was thinking about what my supervisor once said to me that when we understand the structure, a part of us is no longer in the structure. That's true. That is true. And suddenly we're like outside looking at it kind of going, Oh yeah, that's what happens to me. This thing happens and then I get kind of caught and then I tend to go this way. And then suddenly there's like new options. There's new, even yeah. there's just an option to sit with and kind of go, God, that really sucks, you know? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Have some compassion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> get some, that's, a, that's such a great point, Vincent. I really, I totally agree. It's like, even though coherence therapy, for instance, isn't about trying to have this new thing happen, just looking at the old structure with clarity and non-judgment and awareness is a new thing happening, isn't it? It, it? it is, yeah. And you're doing it with somebody, you know, you're bringing in, that's changing the experience already, yeah. isn't it? Because there's somebody, I often hear clients, and I suppose myself, and we can all be going around in a circle around something. And mm -hmm. it's just, it's like a, like running a little maze. Mm -hmm. And we need somebody else to go in there with us to, you know, show us another part of the maze or hey, like, <laughs> just even walk through the maze for a while and yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever. You know. Yeah, that's a nice, I like that thinking of this kind of structures like this, it is a maze. It's like, okay, so so let's slow down and like organize it a little bit, you know, bring some, you know, like, okay. And, and I think that it's like, we're meant to do that with another person. I think it, it's complex and teamwork is like how we do complex things as human, we do them with teamwork. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm wondering, do you have like a, an example you could share with us around some of this that we could kind of, you know, we, maybe for someone who's listening today, um, who's like, like trying to think of you know, what does that look like in practice? Do you, does, does anything come to mind, Tori, for you? Um, yeah, gosh, let me think about that. Um, oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I get very, um, creative sometimes in my experiential work. <laughs> so I could give, you know, like some of the, the examples are kind of colorful. Um, um, like I'm thinking of a, a woman who, you know, felt unsafe and it was like, okay, well in this moment, like, what is that? What are you needing to get safety? You know? And she was like, I want to hide behind your couch. And I was like, okay. You know, she went kind of tucked behind my couch, you know, and, but because we were honoring that she, some flight needed to happen, you know, some it's like that had to happen first versus just override it or pretend it's not wanting. But it was so interesting because then as she was like there behind the couch, it's like, okay, so we're going to start with, we're going to start over. Like, we're like, I'm not assuming we have safety. Like I'm going to find you where you actually are so that then we can you know what I mean? You can't leave a place until you arrive there. Right. It's like, it's like, let's go there. And then like, um, and then it's like, well, is it okay to hear my voice? You know, and while as you're behind there, like how, how far back do you need me to be? You know, how, like, how do you need to imagine this? Or, um, you know, and it did feel okay to hear my voice and just be like, okay, there's no rush. So we're just allowing, we're tracking what happens again. We're tracking then if we meet this experience with safety and care and clarity and well, what happens next, you know? And, you know, it was actually a surprise. She wasn't behind that sofa for too long because it was like almost just the permission and like hearing my voice and just a nice conversation where there was a block, you know, where she couldn't see me. And I was like, okay, so that's, okay, now that I have that, now, and now some safety comes in because I've actually been like protected, like my, you know, um, and so now like, 
now a different thing can emerge, which is wanting to play, you know? And it's like, you know, it's like, She's like, okay, now I want to play. <laughs> you know, it's like, and then I like her cute little eyes like popping above the couch, like, hello, you know, <laughs> like she's ready for, you know. Um, but it was like, it, you know, it's like through honoring though that like, and then she came out and then we played, you know. But like, whereas think about that's just so different than normal social, um, where we override our nervous system. It's just like, well, I see. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm supposed to sit it, here though. and like say what you answer your questions and be an adult and <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah Pick yourself up and do what you think the other person is expecting of you mm-hmm. you know yeah yeah exactly. so i really like that um honoring you know just her and where she was at and the embodiment of it actually the mm-hmm. actually taking herself her body behind the mm-hmm. couch where it felt safer in her body like that embodiment side of experiential therapy hearing the the tone of your voice, perhaps. Yeah. I'm you know, thinking of that sort of, and the play that comes out of the safety then, it makes me think of polyvagal theory a bit yes. there. Her seeking system was like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, yes, but yes, right. She could come into social engagement. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, you know, we're talking about this already, but just like how your experience of yourself, Tori, and how the clients experience of themselves that sort of relational piece. I'm always curious about the experiential side of that. How how do you find that comes into your work? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think it's probably, um, you know, some therapies put real primacy on that. It's like, that is the thing. But even ones that don't, I think probably in any therapy session, no matter what we're doing, it's like the water we're swimming in. I don't, you know, it's like, um, whether you just, name it or not, or you, you know, whether uh, you name it or not, or whether you're doing CBT or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, like, um, <clears throat> I just, because I think it's just so core to our wiring, you know, in our evolution to, um, to teamwork, to collaborate, um, but to always also be attuned to like, but what kind of dance is this, you know? because also people are not always safe or they're not always open for business for real collaboration. Um, They're more just managing us or something or dominating us or whatever, or just like, you're kind of difficult, just put yourself together because I don't want to deal with you, you know, which therapists can accidentally do as well. So, so, So the possibility is always there of coming into some kind of like deep collaboration that actually is um, like allowing the whole self to like emerge or is this one of the ones where myself is too difficult or overwhelming for you or messy or threatening or whatever. And so I need, I need to not do that for you. And so like the mind's just looking at that, you know? And and so I think as therapists, like it is so important that we give every kind of signal we can that like, I actually want to be, I I want to free you to be an actual flow with yourself, you know, really authentically from the, all the way from the bottom up, you know? your body or like what, and we just track it. There's no agenda. And that's that we're not used to no agenda and we really need no agenda, (laughs) you know, to like see what emerges. Right. And um, so I think we have to almost go overboard sometimes with our nonverbals. And I try to both like demo that sort of with my students that also like coach them, like, like practice it in front of the mirror. Like, like, like don't be a blank screen, like just be expressive. Like, have warmth on your face, you know, um, and strength. You know, I think those are the two qualities, like showing like, I've got this, I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm strong, but also I'm warm toward you and I'm curious and I'm here and I'm not distracted, you know? Um, and that, that then begins to like, oh, like, oh, maybe this other thing. So they might not cognitively even know what that's an option, right? But unconsciously it's like, that's a different invitation you know, like, okay, like, and I, I think we don't do enough probably because of our own insecurity. I mean, it's so vulnerable being a client. Like I, I think we have to take on some of that vulnerability as therapists and like be willing to be more than just like the buttoned up professional, you know, even though that's safer for us. Yeah. This is, this is kind of, yeah. What I'm, I'm, I'm asking here is yeah. like, we, we try to model this kind of very empathic curious safe presence 
-hmm. but we're we're people (laughs) (laughs) we're having experiences too yeah (laughs) you know and yeah i mean that's that's a big part of experiential therapy isn't it's our experience of being human like and how the other person is you know affecting us what's happening inside of us right right and letting that be like you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. I think what people don't like is confusion or not being able to read somebody. Mm. Um, so when we're a little bit more congruent like that, and it could be like, wow, what you said really threw me up, you know, I mean, but, but that's, e- that's less threatening than like even someone looking really nice, but inside being angry or oh, do you know what I- that, that kind of mixed signal is really yeah. a threat, threat uh, prompt to <laughs> there out there the walls when it's like, Oh yeah, you're being really professional and nice, but you know, you're annoyed or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Right, 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 right. It'd just be better to be like, God, I'm annoyed. You know what I mean? It's like, um, um, or when we, yeah. And, and I think this is where our own work comes in, obviously, you know, of like, can we, do we feel like we've done enough freeing up of the places inside us that are afraid to go to completion? Would you ever, would you ever, sh- how much of your own experience would you share with the clients, Tori, would you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I'm pretty pro self-disclosure. I'm, I, 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 I'm sometimes surprised I don't do it more frequently, but I think it's partly because I'm so focused on like what's happening now, what's happening now, what's happening now. Um, I'm so focused on the client, but, um, but I can tell you like one of the most powerful forms of self-disclosure I mean, sometimes I'll do like content self-disclosure. Like, like I, like sometimes I'll see women who have fertility issues. Like I've had lots of miscarriages and it took me five years to get pregnant and like, you know, all that stuff. So it's like, I, I, I'm, I'm comfortable to do that, you know, but like, that's probably not actually as powerful as, um, gosh, I'm so touched by what you just said or something like that, you know, or I just find myself wanting to slow down the honor that that felt really important to me. So I think that if you're not comfortable with the, like, I don't want to share personal things about my life, that's, that's actually probably less important of the self-disclosures anyway, even though it can be cool. I mean, it can be useful um, and helpful, but, um, but when it's like, I'm just going to be a real person. And if, and if, if you impact me, you know, um, you know, I might share that with you. I mean, we don't share everything. And sometimes we are regulating, you know, to like, you know, like, you know, and, and figuring out what they're ready to hear and stuff. But, um, but often we are really touched by our work, by the work, you know, and then it's really wonderful and new or sometimes even like, I'll give an example. Like a lot of times my clients will say something like, I'm so grateful, you know, for what you just, what we just did. Or, I'm feeling a lot of affection toward you, Tori, or something like that. Um, and, and what I'll try to do in that moment is like really slow down and show them that I'm letting that in, you know, like, I'll just say, let me just take a moment to let that in. So I kind of needed to hear that today or something or like yeah. everyone thought really, I need that every once in a while, you know, and that really, I'm going to, I'm going to um, remember you saying that and keeping that with me when I need it, you know what I mean? And yeah. like, and it's, and, and I, I found my, it's like, a, it's not selfish. It's like a lovely moment for the client. Cause they're like, Oh my God, I got to help. You know, like I am valuable to you too. <laughs> yeah, I have a positive impact on, yeah. on this person. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. That's, that's a kind of important, right? <laughs> so important. It's so it's empowering. You know, it's like, we're not one up. We're like in it to kind of together. Um, yeah. And then of course, following up with, you know, if you, if when I share something personal, it's like, what is that like to hear me say? Um, because, um, this is something Diana Fosha teaches a lot, but it's not just that they have a new experience and that it's a good experience, but, um, that they know that they had it. Like they're reflect, they're like really bringing awareness to, excuse me. Oh, like that felt good to hear you say, or maybe it pissed me off or whatever. Like, but like now I'm noticing so I can really stay with it and linger with it. It's not just, that was nice. You know? Yeah. I think the word linger is a great one because if a person's quite depressed or anxious all the time, that's the water they're swimming in. So to help yeah. them really like notice what that feels like and to be with somebody with that is going to give them a taste of something else that might, you know, might be another step towards where they want to go. Like That's right. Yeah. Linger. Yeah. Yeah. Because it does also often take time, you know, these kind of, 
for the mind to do what I was calling the work of the mind, you know, like to process something, you know, to integrate it. It's like in that arc, it's not just straight to action. I mean, action often is part of it, but it's like, I have to see what new meaning I have to like work with this. I have to digest it. And then what's going to come next. And, um, I know we've more been talking about, um, the inhibition that we might feel to that shame or anxiety because we've been punished or it's been too much or whatever, but also I think our culture and society, um, is so fast paced. Um, and that's kind of the agenda part too, like so fast paced and like product, like just give it to me now, <laughs> like get your work done, do your thing. Tell me what I need to know, left brain information and great. And <clears throat> that I think we're also just like really socialized to talk, like to just move on from the, to the next thing. One big and, uh, life. Yeah. yeah. And so in therapy, there also is just like a, um, it's hard to linger things because we don't, because we think they're shameful or whatever, but also it's like, no, like give yourself the time because your mind is doing something right there. So like, let this actually happen. We don't have to rush past it happening. Like just, so, you know, sometimes I'll say like, just give it your mind's just trust me, whatever your mind, your mind's doing something right there. Just give it a second, you know, like, like let it breathe, like, or, or just why we keep doing the experiential questions because it's like, stay with it. Like you're allowed to stay with this, with some actual resource attention, you know, like your glucose and your energy, you know, your focus and your intelligence and creativity and time and mine as well as your helper. Like this is important enough that we're like, we can put resources to allow it to see what's going to happen next. Um, and you don't have to rush that you can't rush it. It's like no rushing art, you know, (laughs) I'm thinking of like, like a child who's wrestling with something and the parent just kind of, it's just like, yeah, it's okay. You know, take your time. You're yeah. learning something here or you're making some sense of something here and, and honoring that, that process. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The deeper mind doesn't, um, I mean, it actually processes in some ways really quickly, but it takes a while to integrate, you know, to really, to come up into words and find words and reorganize that does take, um, time that, that, uh, is actually kind of delicious when people finally realize they can get it. You know, they're like, I'm oh, sorry that that just, they're like, oh, you know, this actually feels really good to slow down for a moment. I know I, some clients, I notice like they'll, they'll, they'll sit there and, and I'm not sure whether myself, whether to just wait or to come in and you kind of need to know the person as well. Sometimes don't you, whether they might need a prompt or whether you just just need some space to to mm-hmm. kind of you know reflect on that you know you want this do this is this is a trick i mean this is what i've noticed i've how i do it i don't know that this is the right way but sometimes my students like a little like a little trick you know like this is how you might approach is you know i'll say you know um there's little there's little short statements you can do little short invitations or even short questions or short that it's not like you're taking the conversational ball back to you. Do you know what I mean? Like we often talk in these big chunks, like we're doing, you like, I, I say a big chunk then you say a big chunk and I say a big chunk, but like you can use your language to just kind of like, in fact, it's just a nudge, like keep the ball over you, keep it, but you actually have to say something to, to like encourage them. So sometimes I'll say like, right after they speak right quickly, say something, (laughs) just not a long thing so that they're out thinking you're talking now, just say something like, just stay right with that. Do you know, or just let that breathe or just see what it's like to have said that or just stay with it. You know, um, what, or you, you know what I mean? Or what's, what's that like to articulate or just some little thing that's not me making a big, like, let me summarize the whole thing we just did, which you could do at some moment, but when there's, when they're with something and it's happening, um, usually I encourage my, my students to speak more often, actually, weirdly enough, but just in, in these little tiny things that are, that aren't taking the conversational ball back. It's just kind of like, if anything, like, just like you, it's still your turn. It's still your turn. <laughs> you know, but like, but like, we need the permission because otherwise we'll like, I just think we need the permission. Um, cause otherwise we feel like we're taking too long. So we need that little, like, okay, just stay there. Just stay there. What's that like? Or what, like the, you know, little, little pieces, um, 
frequently but shorter. <laughs> so I've got yeah, to learn it. You know, encouragers, I think we do. <laughs> I don't, not everyone does it that way. And I don't know that it's necessary, but I've just noticed that it works for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, just give the person reminded them of the permission. And I'm thinking of ISCDB as well, like kind of the, the reinforcement, like you keep coming in and, you know, I think John Friedrichson talks about that. It's so hard for a person sometimes to do that piece around just staying with the feeling or whatever that yeah. he's talking about. You know, I remember him once saying like, you know, encouraging maybe three or four times per minute. Yeah, so, there you go. You know, that's one way of doing it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah we do need it. It's, 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 it's so different than normal conversation, you know. Um, even just staying on like, like, like when we're talking, for instance, like once I, like, let's say I say something and then if I've said it, it's like, okay, moving on to the next thing. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I'm staying with it. It's like, okay, we've made that point. Like now on to like some other, we change it. If we've said everything about this, we change the topic. Do you know I mean? That's how normal conversation works. Like, okay, I just described my week and now I just change the topic to something else and another and so it's, I think we expect that people don't want us to stay with something long enough, you know? And I'm thinking about this idea, maybe of being with, that we just need the other person to, 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 to hang out with us, yeah. with whatever is happening. So I suppose I'm thinking again, you, you know, you mentioned Diana Forsha, like, you know, I'm doing aloneness, mm -hmm. you know, kind of whatever's happening for you, I'm honoring that and I want, I, I want, want it. To, I, want I want you to hang out with it. It's okay. And I'd like to, I'd like to wait to see what, what emerges kind of, I guess. I'd like to wait to see what emerges. Yeah. I think there's a real um, trust in the human mind and the human diet, you know, both human relationship and the human mind. Um, that's, that's implicit in that. Like, look, we don't need to manage anything. You know, yes, I'm here to, to give some guardrails. Like if it gets out of the window of tolerance or whatever, we can do some things, but we don't need to overmanage this. Like we can trust that if we just like through awareness is kind of like, like sometimes I have the image of like, like it's like a little fire, like, you know, and I don't know if you ever started a fire with like a little kindling and there's like a little ember and then you just like blow on it kind of, you know, it's like, it's like, like the, like the client through our question and through our, you know, these little tiny little encouraging encouragers. It's like, we keep blowing on the fire kind of like, it's not like a base, just like little puffs that allow it to kind of like keep seeing where it's going to go next. And they release a trust. There's like, a, it's like, look, just let it go where it's going to go somewhere good. <laughs> you know, your mind will do something with it because it can do that. It knows how. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking about something you said earlier on, uh, Tori, about the creativity side of experiential therapy mm -hmm. and how every individual client is, is somebody that we're, we're tuning to. We're trying to see yeah. how this can work. Um, at least that's kind of how I think about it. Mm -hmm. Do you find that creative side of experiential therapy is a like part of it for you? I think it's lovely. It's like, it's kind of being like a flow state or something like that. You know, it's like, um, I mean, I love creativity. I, I love, I, I do like songwriting and, um, like poet, you know, just like what's gonna, what's gonna merge that has never existed before. It's, it's almost like the moment is art, you know, um, because it's so beautiful. Um, um, and just like, if you were creating art, you can't do it with like like do like, you know, you can't tell someone like write a poem right now that has to be good about this. And you have five seconds, you know what I mean? It's like, that's not, that's not how creation happens. You know, it's like, let's just see if we, if we trust the, trust ourselves in the process, like is something new going to emerge a new insight, new, like new embodied experience. That's a very beautiful one, you know, or it's like opening or, um, or it's constricting, but I can feel it still feels a good, like I can I'm trusting it because there's like an underneath, like, no, this needs to happen. You know, I can feel something that's working on something um, that, uh, that I think is what makes our work like so beautiful. And, you know, like the word delicious came to me a second ago, but like, it's like, wow, like that feels, you can feel it's like a different, um, 
energy in the air or something like that. As like when, when that movement, basically when that movement toward completion is actually finally happening again. Yeah, so satisfying. So satisfying. For us, as well as the client, it's like, it's a kind of a co-creative kind of win-win really, isn't it? Like, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I'm thinking about, I think again, Diana Fulcher has a nice line, like she has something like, the, the last step never should never feel bad or something. Like that. Yes, that's right. Right. If it uh, if it's bad, you haven't finished it yet. Yeah. If it's just to say, God, that was awful. <laughs> and do some grieving, which are is a natural innate thing we can do. Like we evolved to be able to grieve, mm-hmm. and it doesn't. I mean, it's I don't know if so, so it feels good, but like it's almost like completion. There is always some type of relief or satisfaction. Um, when the mo- when there's a movement toward completion, even if we're not at the final completion yet, which then it really feels good. Yeah. But even just as we f- can feel something organizing that has a movement, it's like we're used to the pain of being stuck, and that that's like a not a healthy pain. <laughs> you know, it's just like a, it doesn't. It's, it's a you know, it's kind of pointless suffering in a way like that pain of being stuck. But there may be pain in movement. But if you can feel, it's a different type of pain, and like. And when, and when the movement is there, even if you're in pain or grieving or angry, it's like the system saying like, uh, but yeah, but I want more of this because I can feel it's going somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to somebody else uh, in another interview and they were talking about, you know, there's causes like there's causes in the past, but then there's like the cause that the, what's, been, what's pulling us towards a direction that yeah. feels like growth or some yeah. kind of like completion or something that that somehow yeah. feels better. It does. Yeah. And I think most people, and we have to make it safe enough because their expectation, this is horrible, we'll be running and that could color the whole thing. But if we orient them to the moment, like, no, try see what's happening right now, not the expectation, but what's at, if we actually just show up listen, to see, um, I think most people are actually in a moment almost, not with that much training, but almost in a moment can begin to detect. Yes, this is, this is, I don't know, whatever I was scared of, you know, it's a little painful or it's a little confusing and I have to sit with it, but I can feel that if I can feel some movement happening, it also feels good at the same time. And so just ha- no, ha- allowing that to be noticed, like, okay, good. Notice that, like a, a developing appreciation for that. Yeah. It tastes good or it's delicious or it tastes <laughs> better than what was happening before. It's yeah. very, again, we're, I like the way we're using these kind of very tactile experiential and yeah. uh, yeah words here it's it's kind of really yeah it is because it's a it's a sensation it's not a thought it's like we just it's different it, it feels different it, it yeah 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 so we're coming towards the end of our interview Tori um so I'm just kind of like I'm just looking through my I think you know I have these questions that we've kind of covered yeah. most of uh what, what what I thought we'd look at um would you would you kind of have any message for therapists who've never really done any experiential therapy, maybe somebody who's trained in a very other kind of modality, like what would you say is like, you know, the, the best things about it uh, for you or how you see clients benefiting or how it enriches you um, as a person? Yeah. It's funny. I go back to this word beauty, um, that it's beautiful, but it's not even just that it's beautiful. It is beauty. Like, I think it is what beauty is is when we feel that there's a movement toward wholeness or, or to say solving a problem sounds kind of like not that poetic, but like toward actual engagement that improves something that builds a connection or builds a house or builds an idea or builds a, a new like spiritual perspective. You know, it's like, builds some, it's like when there's actual movement and I think that's why we think art is beautiful because or anything that we say is beautiful. I think it's because it's helping us re-engage in that way. You know, it's like, oh, it's a moment of beauty. It's like, oh, that's like what was what I meant for. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and so to me, if that's possible, if we can do that in therapy and not just symptom manage, um, like I think we have a birthright to that as humans. I think it's what we all deeply crave. And it's amazing. It's a, it's a, it's, it's exquisite to see a client, to feel like you are part of facilitating that. And it requires your own opening of that in your own life, which means stepping into a more beautiful life and experience of being human. 
Yeah. There was freedom. You know, when you're not pinned in by like, I can't do that. I can't do that. What if I can do all of that? There's so much vitality that comes back online. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if I'm allowed. Yeah. If I can be, if I can feel, if I can want, if I can not want, if I can, you know, if like all that's allowed and not like, you know, because I'm not supposed to, or it's dangerous, it'll be too much. Right. I go, no, actually that's, I can do that. I know how to do that. I'm not going to get dysregulated. I can have emotion. I can, you know, um, then, uh, yeah, I think it's so freeing. So it's like both for the beauty of the moment and like how it changes our own lives. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, I agree. I mean, as therapists, we need to re be renewed and we need to find this, our own source. We need to grow. I think, you know, there's an equality there between us and our clients in the sense that we're all experiencing yeah. and we're all people growing. So to be, you know, in connection with somebody and sharing that is beautiful. Definitely. Yeah. 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 And, you know, um, and I think that I, yeah, I love that what you said. It's like the quality, like we're, we're all co journeyers. Um, and I think that's why I started a YouTube channel a few years ago. And I love making content that just explains this stuff because to me, it's not like, like, I maybe don't need to know like why that medicine works, like that the doctor gives me, <laughs> you know, but in therapy, like it shouldn't just be a passive thing that we're receiving. It's like, no, this is like all of us together learning about being human, you know? And so that's like, when I train, I like training therapists. I like doing training groups, but like, I also love kind of like feeling like I'm like, like it's the YouTube channel is very gratifying. Cause it's like, anybody's smart enough to get this stuff, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. So like, and it's very exciting and like inspiring information. Like I just did a, um, a series on IFS, you know, like, like, okay, let me see if I can like put this into language, you know, so that it's like, you know, if you're an IFS client, you can watch it and be like, oh, that makes sense, you know? And it allows me to approach myself with less shame basically and more empowerment, you know? Yeah, and then we're not hiding behind sort of terminology or whatever. We're trying to make it as immediate as we can. While at the same time, I suppose, you know, theory is kind of Moorish if you like theory. <laughs> so, <you know. laughs> well, that's what I see. That, that's what I love to do is like geek out on all the theory. Yeah. And then like take it and translate it into like human speak. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the best. Like just really, you know, metaphors that are as yeah. simple as intuitive as you can get. Like, yeah, exactly. Very, very fun. Yeah. 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 So Tori, listen, look, it's been an absolute joy to meet yeah. you and to, to talk today. And so thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank and you. you know, it's my pleasure. Yeah. And maybe, maybe we'll get to do a follow up at some stage. Yeah, that'd be lovely. Yeah. So thanks so much. Yeah. Take care, everyone. And take care, Vincent.